Right, gentlemen. I want to give a little bit of a study tonight on starting in Genesis. It may seem very simple when we start, but you'll see why. And as you proceed, I'm hoping that some of the lights go on. But I want to talk about what has to happen for God to restore the spiritual authority of men. We have a natural authority, but we need to have a spiritual authority in our homes, in our Christian walk. One of the things that concerns me is that I see too many men passive in the service for God and too many wives taking the leading role in the home spiritually. In other words, the women are encouraging us and we are following very often. But, and there's also a little bit of an attitude among men that, you know, it's, I'm a man and I don't connect to spiritual things. We connect to spiritual things as fast as anybody else. So, we're going to go back right to the Garden of Eden. So let's go in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. And I want to read verse 8 and then from verse 15. Okay. So in chapter 2, and it says, And the Lord planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Okay. Now I come down to verse 15. And then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will not eat, for in the day that you eat it you will surely die. Okay, so let's ask ourselves a few questions. We're going to look first of all at the word God put Adam in the garden to tend it. The expansion of that means God put him in the garden to, to work under his authority. How big do you think the Garden of Eden was? An acre? A hundred acres? Twenty kilometers by fifty kilometers? We don't know, do we? But we know it wasn't an acre. So do you think that God put Adam in the garden to, as a gardener? When God, we read our Bible, it says God put Adam in the garden to tend it. And many of the commentaries say, God put man there to work the soil and take care of the plants. Have you tried to take care of plants on a, on a 20 by 30 kilometer garden? Okay, so let's, let's realize that this garden was taking care of itself. And let's realize that there was a different significance to this garden than we see at face value. And the significance was it had these two trees in it and God put man there and he said to Adam, I'm placing you under my authority to take care of my, of my property. Okay, so you can write at the top God and then you can put down a little arrow and you can put Adam. All right, Eve, Eve wasn't around then. So down further along, we see that God took of Adam's roof and he formed Eve as a helpmeet. Now, the next thing he told Adam, that he was to keep it, to tend it and to keep it. Meaning, to guard it. I will place you under my authority, in my property, there's two trees there, and I want you to take care of it and to guard it. Now those two trees were spiritual trees. Tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. In other words, they had a spiritual reason. And he's telling Adam, there's a reason I want you to do something here and there's something I want you to protect. So, we have God, Adam in the garden taking care of something. The full dynamic of the spiritual consequence or what it was, we don't know. But we do know that there were those two trees there. And we do know that Adam was given a responsibility 
under God's authority. Eve was not there. Eve came along later. Yes? She was shopping at the time. So she came along later. Now, so you can put down there Adam, and then you can put down a little Adam, arrow that comes down, and you put Eve, right? So now, come to Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the who? To the woman. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, I want you to realize something. That when, when Satan comes along, Watch what he does. He decapitates that. He attacks this right there. That's where he goes. He goes to the woman. He bypasses Adam's authority. He bypasses God's authority. And he engages Eve. And that's where the trouble starts. Okay? The whole key we've got to look at is under whose authority are we living? Okay? So now he bypasses Eve and he goes straight to the issue. And the issue he's discussing is a spiritual one. Okay? So he says in verse 1, has, in God, has God indeed said? In other words, God had given Adam the command that he was to take care of the garden. Eve was his helpmeet. She was not meant to be his co-warrior. She wasn't a soldier there guarding the garden. Whose responsibility was it to guard the garden? Adam. Okay? So now, we now come to verse 3. And they have a little discussion here, and it says, Now the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Eve starts to engage this whole story, and she, and she do you think Adam told her about the trees? I think he did. I think very clearly he did. I think he said to her, Now look here, honey pie. I want you to know that we have a responsibility and these two trees and this is what they hear and this is what God has asked me to do. Okay, so when you go shopping, don't pick that fruit. Leave it alone. Enemy engages her and she turns around and she, she, she ignores Adam and she starts to take an authority of her own and she says, God has said and she twists the whole thing up back to front. Okay, now, here we go. For in verse, in verse 5, uh, for the one few times in his life, Satan tells the truth. Okay? For he says to her, For God knows that in the day you eat of the tree, out of it, your eyes will be opened, you shall be like God, you shall be like God, knowing good and evil. So two things. He said, first of all, you will be like God, meaning you will be able to live a life independent of God's authority. You should be like God. If you participate in here and do what I'm asking you to do, you'll be able to live a life independent of God's authority. And secondly, you'll be able to know good and evil, meaning you'll be free to make your own moral decisions. Now that becomes the foundation of every sinner. A sinner's desire is to live a life independent of God's authority. A sinner's desire is to live a life where we can choose what's right and wrong and we can live our moral lives on our own terms. So every sinner is born with those two qualities in his heart. And Satan promised her that if that happens, that if you do that, that's what's going to happen. Now remember that. Because in all that we see in the world affairs and what's going on, it's based on those two things. Okay, right there. So he tells her those two things. Now in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit. Eve desires what Satan offers her. She doesn't go and ask Adam. She doesn't ask God. She takes a position that is her own. And then it says, and she gave her husband 
with her and he ate. Now the scripture is a bit ambiguous, but I don't think Adam was standing there watching this program. I think Adam had walked in on the story. She either took the fruit and went to him, or he arrived. And he said, what's going on? And he's standing by the tree, and she's got the fruit in her hand, and she turns around, and she gives it to him. Adam's choice right then was to submit to God and to take his place or to submit to his wife. That was the problem. Right there, what Adam did is he submitted to his wife and in doing so and accepting the fruit, he severed that. Whoops. He broke his relationship with God and he was no longer under God's spiritual authority. That's called the fallen man. So Adam came here. He accepted that. He got involved emotionally with that. And he broke that line. It looks very simple, what I'm saying at the moment. But where we are going, you're going to understand from the scriptures why that is so significant. Okay? So the result of what we are saying is this, the fall of man. Romans chapter 5 now. And let's have a look at it. And verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. It does not say through one woman. It says through one man. God had given the authority, the spiritual authority to Adam, and he held Adam accountable for Eve's actions. He held Adam accountable for his decision to cooperate with her. He held Adam accountable for not defending the property that he gave him through one man. Okay? Now we have a drama because we've got the, the couple chucked out of the garden and everything is going wrong. Now I come back to Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. I'm going to read it simply because we, we take this and it's God put it in place but there's, there's something missing. And so to the woman he says... I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your, and, you, and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. The word rule there means to govern or to protect. Okay, here's the problem. Okay, he says to Adam, to the, to the woman, your husband is going to rule over you. But there's one little issue missing in the equation. So, and that is, where has that gone? That's not there. Okay? That's missing. So now we have Adam in a carnal state. Ego. Pride. He says, he puts Eve back in her place. He says, Eve, I want you to understand that you are going to be under the authority of the man. But the man has lost his submission to God. Therefore, the man exercises this authority in a carnal way. And that is the problem that we have with every man and every marriage. We exercise our right in our home using our ego, using our pride, and the result is this. We have rebellion. Somewhere, the wife starts to push back because wherever this link is broken, here, man's authority becomes a natural one. It becomes an egocentric one. And there is no life in that. There is the issue right there. So I'm the head of my house. I want my wife and my kids to listen to me. But I am not under authority. And because I'm not under authority, I actually don't have authority. I'm enforcing something through my fallen nature, 
through my natural character. I'm enforcing something with my natural strength. The family was not meant to run on those rules. Mankind wasn't meant to run on those rules, okay? So we're going to get a little problem. So now come back to Romans chapter 5 where we're going to stay for a few minutes. Okay, verse 11. Speaking of the death of Christ, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That word means the reconciliation between God and men. It is more than just the atonement. It is this. So, um, where's my fancy board? I want to take, I need a rubber. Here we go. Okay. I want to show you something. You need my pen? Adam, in his fallen state, it says, we have now received reconciliation. So what we have is that God takes this out of the equation for now. And what does he do? He puts the second Adam here. He puts the second Adam there. And what, is, what does the second Adam do? He reverses what the first Adam did. He goes on the cross and he pays for our sins. And in reconciliation, he, breaks, he reverses what the first Adam did, relinks man to God, and then brings man under his authority. Would you agree? Okay. You can tidy that up. Make it look bigger. Okay. So the second Adam. Romans chapter 5 verse 15. Now the free gift is not like the offense. For by one man's offense, Adam, many died. Much more, the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Much more. It's more than just Jesus dying on the cross and we get forgiveness of sins. The second Adam opened the door for man to be reconciled to God and for man to take his place as God ordained him to take his place properly. Okay? Verse, chapter 5, verse 17. For by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, Jesus Christ. So there's an authority that God wants to give back to Adam. It's what he lost in the garden. There's an authority that he wants to give back to man. So now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Okay. Uh, God, Adam, yeah, man. So in 2 Adam, just put Christ next to it there. Okay, now you'll see. In verse 3, For I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. All right? So now let's put that in order quite, quite quickly here. So we have the head of Christ is, so we have God, he is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. Let's put it in another way. Christ is submitted. Fully submitted to the Father. In order to do his will. Man must be fully submitted to Christ in order to take his place. When that happens, the woman will understand what it means and be submitted to her husband. What we do, in most cases, is this little word here is removed from the equation. There. I go to church. I can be born again. I want to serve the Lord. But this word submission to the authority of Christ is what 
is missing in the equation. To what extent are we talking about this word, submission? Because it's the reverse of the ego. It's the reverse of the natural man. It's the reverse of living a life independent of God. It's a reverse of each man making his own moral decisions. It's the reverse of everything in the garden. It goes back to what was in the garden before the nonsense. Okay? And so it goes against our natural thinking because man some way thinks if I understand that and I submit, I've lost my manliness. I've lost my natural desire to be the boss, to be the chief, and to make my mark on life. That is the carnal nature. And that is what causes all the stories in life. It's ego, pride, and all the things that accompany the natural man. We're going to look at this little relationship here, and then we're going to look at that little relationship there. When the penny goth drops, you're going to understand the seriousness of what we're talking about. All right. So, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Just verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right. So, right up there uh, on the side, write the word beggar for me. Can you spell it? Not, 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 yeah, on the top with an E, not a U. Ben? Okay. It was Milton you went to, right? <laughs> so now, when it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, the word there means to be, to have the attitude of a beggar. And it means this. A beggar is somebody who has no natural resources of their own that they can depend on. So if a guy's got a uh, half a leg, whatever it is, and he's, he's asking because he can't work, he's asking for help. When he comes to you as a beggar, when a beggar approaches you, you are the, you, you are, he's demanding of you, asking of you your resources, for he has no resources of his own. You are become his source. So he says, blessed is the one who comes to God with no natural resources of his own, understanding that God is his source. That is what that scripture means. Blessed is the one who comes to God understanding that in himself he has no natural resources, not his personality, not his character, nothing natural is going to do the job, and that his only hope is that from the, from the power of God's grace and the throne that God has, that God has the resources that I need to do what I have to do. I come to God with that attitude of dependency. That is what that little verse means. Blessed is the one who comes to God, seeing him as his only source, for his is the kingdom of heaven. Now we're talking about submission. Now we're talking about relationship. Now we're talking about understanding what it means to pick up our cross, lose our lives, and engage properly in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, Matthew chapter, John chapter 5. And verse 19. And Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the Father do, for whatever he sees what the Father does, the Son does in a like manner. Christ did not operate in any form of self-strength. No, he did not take an office unto himself. He came in complete submission to the Father, and he said, 
so the, the son can do nothing of himself. He is completely a beggar that depends upon his father. If Jesus operated with the authority that he had on the earth, his authority came from his submission. His authority was not given so that he could operate independently. And we marvel at the authority that Jesus had. But if you look at Matthew 25 and the story of the talents, which is one of the last things that Jesus taught before he died, the talents are not personal abilities. The English word confuses it. It's not personal abilities. The talents are the, are the property of the master. He has, he has something very valuable uh, in his hand, is his buildings, whatever it is. And he comes to his senior servant and he says, here is my property. I'm going away. Will you take care of it for me? And that servant looks at takes what the master does and he treasures the master's property so that when the master comes back, he has looked after it so well, he's doubled its value. Then he says, well done, you good and faithful servant. I will take back what is mine. The talents are not about whether I can sing in the choir or, you know, I've got, God gave me an ability to do something. It's all about what belongs to the master. In other words, we are the unprofitable servant that takes what belongs to the master and we are willing to count our life, have no value to our lives except that we may take what is his and use our lives for his glory so that we may give back to him what is his at the end of the day. Correct? When we have that attitude, there's an authority from the master that comes to the heart of a surrendered servant. It's not our authority. It's God's authority. Somewhere hidden in that is the power of the name of Jesus. We quote the name of Jesus. We run around saying in Jesus' name. But it doesn't work because we're not under the authority of Christ in with a surrendered heart. This guy comes along, Jesus comes along, and he says, I'm fully submitted to the authority of the Father as an unprofitable servant, having no identity of my own except that I may do the Father's will. And therefore, the Father entrusted him with the authority to do what he had to do. Everything he did was an extension of the Father. It was not his own strength. Make sense? Okay. John chapter... 6 verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I have, in, in Philippians it says he, he was equal to God. He could have walked on this earth as an equal to God, but he chose to humble himself. And take on the form of a man. He turns around and he says, I have not come in my own will to have my own plans, my own desires. I have laid that aside. I have come only to do the will of him who sent me. So if we go into back to Corinthians and we have this little dynamic here where God is, Christ is submitted to God and man is submitted to Christ, the relationship between Christ and the Father surely has to become the relationship between man and Christ. Would that make sense? Okay. So now, John chapter 6 verse 56 and verse 57 says the same thing. But I want you to see this carefully. He's now talking about, let's go back to verse 53. Most assuredly I say unto you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you've got no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I 
in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. The idea of eating my flesh and drinking my blood is very simple. If you are willing to follow me, you will draw from me in the same way that I have been drawing from my Father. If the life of the Father is in me, then the life of the Father will be in you. So it means that you have no natural strength of yourself, no natural wisdom of your own, no natural abilities of our own. Those are things we lay aside in a point of surrender that I may live to know him, the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. The successful man is the man that has learned to place his will under the authority of Christ and he lives that the will of the Lord may become the extension of his life. So we aren't Christians who have careers and God is tracked on, tacked on to the back of the bus. We go to church on Sunday to feel good and to ask God to bless my dreams and my aspirations and all the rest. No problem with the career, but here's the issue. First, I must know that my will is submitted to him completely and then as I live, whatever I am doing has got to be an extension of my surrender to the purposes of God. And I have to understand that God puts something in my hand, something for the kingdom that belongs to him. My first priority is to be, take what God entrusted me with, the master, and to make sure that I treat it properly and for his glory. When I understand that, some way spiritual life comes back to the man. The man starts to find his home in order. He starts to find his children in order. There's an authority that he's not self-manufactured. It's back to the Garden of Eden because the authority actually came from God. But it's spiritual. You don't have to enforce it. Okay? Now look at Matthew chapter 20. That's why the, in many ways these things are called a mystery. So Matthew 20 is a, from verse, verse 20 is the story of the sons or the mother of Zebedee and she comes to Jesus about her two sons and she's saying to him, my sons can one be on your right hand and one on your left hand in the kingdom. Now meaning one can be the prime minister and you know, one can be the minister of finance, whatever. I want some, I want some traction here. I want some, some prestige. And Jesus said, no, it's not going to happen. But are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And they said yes. And right there is the question that we have to ask ourselves. Because the cup that he drank was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what was that cup? Father, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but thy will be done. And there's a cup that God brings to every man. And that cup is, are you willing? It's not about salvation now. It's, are you willing to take this cup and say, Father, not my will, but thine be done. It's a painful cup. It's a cup that works deep on the inside. It's a cup that makes me feel that I have become weak, that I've become impoverished, that I have, in a sense, lost my ability to make my own plans and to lead my own life. And that's exactly what God wants. That cup has a poison in it. It's the poison of the cross that puts death to the flesh, but it brings life to the inner man. That cup has a pain attached to it. That cup is a bitter cup. Most men do not want to drink that cup. We want to have our career. We want to own our lives. We want to lead our, our lives on our own terms. And the overflow of my time I might give to God. We're not talking about time here. We're talking about the attitude of the heart. When a heart is completely broken and surrendered in the presence of God, I can work my work. But the work I'm doing is not the reason I live. There's no, it's not the purpose that I live. Something has changed. I have a heavenly vision. I have a, a heart that seeks only to please the master. My life is completely surrendered to his purposes. 
I'm talking about something that is deeply spiritual, that on a deep surrender that's going to happen in the heart of a man for him to connect and understand the mystery of the gospel. And you can only cry to God for that to happen. So, are we willing to pick up our cup and go to it? Now, John 16, go back, let's go there. In John 16, he's speaking of the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, he says, And however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So when the Holy Spirit comes, whose authority is the Holy Spirit under? I should put the Holy Spirit here, shouldn't I? Okay? Jesus said, I will send you the Spirit, and he will take what is mine, and he will reveal it to you. So he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will not speak of his own authority, but he will take what is, belongs to the Father, and he will reveal it to you, on the condition that you are under his authority. The Holy Spirit is not my friend that walks next to me, and I have a casual chat to. He's my casual counselor. Like Holy Spirit, you know, what shall I do today? Um, what do you think? I, you know, let's have a talk about life. It's not like that at all. The Holy Spirit brings the revelation of, the, of all the things of the kingdom. And he brings them to me and says, Now, will we walk together and I walk first and you follow me? And in that journey... I will talk to you about your character. In the journey, I will talk to you about your pride. In the journey, I will talk to you about your priorities. In the journey, I will talk to you about your prayerlessness. In the journey, I will talk to you about the love of self. In the journey, I will talk to you about all the things that you think I don't notice. Because in that journey, I demand complete and utter submission to my authority. I will put you back under the authority of God. We call it the work of the cross. But that's what it is. We, if I pick up my cross, what have I done? I've denied myself so that I may be able to follow him. Now, therefore, in the context of what we are looking at, now, come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And verse 5. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Very interesting question. Now, you say, okay, that word rule means that my family have got to do what I say. I'm in charge. Okay, <laughs> come with me now to mm, Luke chapter 10. There's only one other time that that word is used in the New Testament. And that's in Luke chapter 10 and verse 35. Okay. And it's the story of the Good Samaritan. I just want to get there. Okay. And this is what it says. And so on the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii and he gave it to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him. For whatever more you need, when I come again, I will repay you. Where do you see the word rule there? Take care. That's the same word. In other words, if a man does not know how to take care of his family, how can he take care of the church? The word rule is not a carnal word where I expect submission and I expect obedience and I expect people to do what I say. It's the exact opposite. It says, if a man is able to submit his life entirely to Christ under the Holy Spirit, he will know how to take care of his family. He will know how to serve his wife. He will know how to love his children. He will know how to lead his home as a servant. And out of that, the authority that God gives him is spiritual. The woman 
will automatically want to follow. The idea wives submit to your husbands is the tail at the end of the donkey. This is where it starts. We reverse it. I'm, in order to be a spiritual man, my wife must be submitted to me. No. In order to be a spiritual man, I must know that my life is fully submitted to Christ and the order will flow down as a, riving, as a, as a river of living waters. What blocks it is the man. So we're going back now to the Garden of Eden. We're going back to where the second Adam has come, died, reconciled us, and said to man, I reconciled you to God. I put you back in right relationship with the Lord. If you will bring your life under the authority of the Holy Spirit, which is my authority, and serve me as an unworthy servant, giving your life entirely for the things of the kingdom, the authority I have, I will pass to you. But you don't own it. It's not your authority. It comes from God. That authority has life. That authority, the words that I speak, said Jesus, are spirits and they are life. There was an authority in his words. He spoke and people understood. He spoke and people were healed. Men and women, let's put it another way. The church needs to come back that when we share and preach and do things, we carry something in the spirit that's beyond ourselves. We carry something in the spirit that brings men to repentance. We pray for the sick and they get healed. We long for those days. Lord, we pray, give us a revival. But where does the revival start? God wants, we want to be, have a church full of men who's, who are running their lives on their terms, going to God, praying for revival, but every single man has not found the place of full submission to the authority of Christ. When this happens, there, watch out for what God will do through us. Watch out. It's a mystery because the natural man does not understand it. It defies our ego. It defies our logic. It's like I've given something away, which is exactly what we've done. We've given away our pride. We've given away our ego. We've given away our independence. We've given away all the traditions of man, all the thinkings of man, all the traditions of, of the world and our desire to live independent of God's authority and to make our own moral decisions. We've given away all of that. We come back to one place. I am an unworthy servant. What, Lord, would you have me to do? And now the Holy Spirit comes and he says, let's walk together. And suddenly, I find life. I find wisdom. I find an energy. I find a flow. And I'm talking to the Father. And I'm back in the place where my heart should really be. You can pray and fast all day long. As long as I do not, and you do not understand what I'm putting on the board, we are simply folding our arms and praying and saying, God, please answer my prayers for these are my plans, these are my dreams, and I'm asking you to bless the work of my hands. And God cannot do that. He cannot bless independence. So the price of being a godly man is the price of being a beggar. Is to come before the Lord and say, I've emptied myself, Father. You're the one that has all that I need. And I'm going to stay in your presence until I find what you have for my heart. And with that heart, I will go out. With that heart, I will love my wife. With that heart, I'll take care of my children. With that heart, I'll go to work. With that heart, I'll serve in the church. And suddenly, I, will pro I can promise you the things of the church become alive. The things of the kingdom come alive. We don't serve out of obligation. We serve out of faith. It's like we own something. There's a revelation, there's an urgency, there's a life within us. Why? Because it's come straight from the throne of grace and it's alive in my heart because the Father entrusted me with something. Yes. Now watch men rise up and take their place. Now watch us move mountains. Now watch us do crusades. Now watch us do what we have to do. No one will take the glory. No one will cross the lines. Everyone will know one thing. I am merely a servant doing what God asked me to do. But what joy I have seeing the power of Christ work out there. Amen. Yes. There is our key. If you can make any sense out of my artwork, you are welcome. 
Does that make sense to you? Should make sense here. Not here. Amen. So I wanted just to challenge you with that. It's something I've been looking through and looking through for a while. And for me, in my life, my own life, this, every day I'm going before God with this. Every day I'm saying, God, my heart. Do I understand what I'm, what, what I'm sharing with you? Do I understand this? Because I don't think I fully do. All I know is I, I am willing to take a road that more and more my life may be an extension of his heart, yes. his will. Yes. And he must do what he wants. I want to hold those little talents he put in my hand and make sure that when he comes, I give back what he gave me doubled. He's got no vision of mine in it. Do you understand that? It's not my career. I don't have a career. I don't have a name. I don't have nothing. All I am ever is a man. A Christian man is a servant in, of the kingdom holding the things that are precious to Jesus. The rest are natural things. May God open our eyes to see the way ahead. Amen. Amen. So five minute break and then Peter's going to come and we are going to have an amazing time. All right. So the Lord bless you. See all the men in the church. Eh? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Watch out, ladies. Eh? <laughs> so I, I'm walking with a stick um, for two reasons. First of all, you know, coming here year after year and just seeing Richard get older and older, <laughs> I just felt bad that I wasn't changing. <laughs> so I asked myself, what could I do? to try to bridge the gap, you know? So this is the easiest, so um, he's not even here, is he? I can say all, what, all sorts of things now. So um, that's not the truth. Uh, but just to save me giving explanation to all 100 people, and please go home and tell your wife what happened, then they don't have to come and ask me when I see them. But I had some surgery on my leg, and I'm in the process of recovery. We got that? Okay, you don't have to put that in the notes, though. All right. <laughs> so, uh, let's uh, go to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. I heard the story of a man who went to a men's meeting. And at the men's meeting, he heard all sorts of scriptural truths about what men are. They are the priest of the home. They're the king in the home. They're the leader. They're, you know, so he was quite excited about all of these teachings and principles and realizing that he was the shepherd and the main guy in the home. So he went home and uh, thought it would be good. She, his wife said to him, what did you hear and, and how did it go? He said, no, it went very well and this is what I heard, that I'm the priest I'm the king, I'm the boss, I'm the shepherd, I'm the leader. And he told her all the things that he had heard, so, um, which was quite bold of him. So uh, a few, few days later, he bumped into his friend, and his friend said, what happened to you? Because he had two big black eyes. <laughs> and uh, he had to do some explaining that uh, his wife didn't take the news too, too well. So... <laughs> As he said to one thing, he said, I didn't see my wife for a while. So he, the guy said, why? He said, well, after a few days, I began to see a little bit out of this eye, you know. <laughs> uh, in Acts chapter 15, uh, there was a problem in the church over the issue of circumcision. So I just wanted to clarify this, and we'll have a special ceremony straight afterwards. <laughs> There's some very nervous laughter here tonight. <laughs> We're going to do the old-fashioned way using blunt stone. Anyway, or Richard's pocket knife, which he's promised me that he's licked clean. But in Acts chapter 15, there was a problem of, uh, and conflict in the church of a sick circumcision. And uh, this issue of circumcision 
and the Old Testament and Old Covenant principles were creeping back into the church. Uh, the laws of the Old Covenant were creeping back into the church and so this became a contentious issue which was raised in Jerusalem at the council of all the apostles and all the elders which you can read in verse 6 they came together to consider this matter and there was much dispute and at that meeting Peter the other Peter rose up and said to them men and brethren you know that a good while ago God chose among us and he begins to expound uh, what Jesus did and how Jesus came and accomplished and what he accomplished on the cross uh, so once they had dis determined that, it was decided that the contents of that meeting and the decisions of that meeting would be written down and the letter would be sent to all the churches. And so uh, Paul and Barnabas were released, or Paul and Silas as well, were released uh, with this letter and they began to, to distribute the letter on their travels. And basically the contents of the letter are found from verse 24 where it says since we have heard that some of you who went out from us have troubled you with words and so it goes on you must be circumcised etc etc and so in verse 25 it seemed good to us and then uh, it comes down in verse 28 uh, and in this letter a little statement that's made it says for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us because I think the apostles realized that unless there was the ministry of the Holy Spirit it would be easy just to replace one set of principles with another replace the old covenant teachings with the new covenant teachings and unfortunately, there's a mentality in the church today where Christians live all under the old covenant spirit with new covenant teachings. It's interesting to understand that even the teachings of Jesus were part of the old covenant because he had not died. All that he said becomes reality to the New Testament or New Covenant Christian through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you see the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And all that we have heard tonight and the truth of what we have heard tonight and I, I, was, I was refreshed in my heart of the, the truth that we have heard but we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit. To be able to take what we've heard and write it on the tablets of our heart. Otherwise it just becomes another principle, another teaching, another doctrine. And what inhibits or blocks the ministry of the Holy Spirit writing on the tablets of our heart is the state of our heart. And the biggest issue that we as men have is something called pride. Some of you don't know what that is. I can see that blank look on your face. Pride, what, pride. What, what is he talking about, pride? <laughs> but it's pride that blocks us. And I, you know, when Richard talking about submission, I was reminded of the centurion in Matthew chapter 12. And it's amazing how when, when he is faced with Jesus and he's looking for healing for his servant, Jesus is talking about faith but the centurion is understanding is submission and he says I know I understand submission because I know what it is to be under authority and I know what it is to have men in authority and you know for those of you who've been in the military or had any understanding of the military when you go on your basic training they have only one objective and that's to break you to bring you to the place where you're just a number to break you and I remember my own training where we came from all sorts of backgrounds and levels of education and social standings and so on but by the time your basic training is finished you're all the same 
You think the same, you look the same, you talk the same, you smell the same. It's the same. <laughs> There's nothing of you left. Nothing of you left. Because true submission starts with nothing of you left. <laughs> so if I, if I want to if I want the, the word of God and the teachings of God and the, and the truths of God and the new covenant to really take root in my heart and my life, then something needs to change and there needs to be this submission and, this, and it can only come with a brokenness and when God deals with my pride of which we all suffer. You know, pride is, is the author of, of destruction in our life. And pride comes to us in so many different forms and ways. Pride about who we are. Pride about what we have done. Pride about where we have come from, what we have accomplished. Pride that I'm not like you. Thank the Lord. <laughs> huh? Pride that I have more or have less or whatever it is. It's pride. It's pride. And as, as men, we are more vulnerable than any other species on the face of the earth. It's pride. And pride just, it blocks us. It, it, it hardens our hearts. When you, when you think of the, in 2 Kings chapter 5, when, when Naaman, Naaman, this great warrior, this great commander of the Syrian army, was a leper. And he hears about this, this uh, prophet in Israel who can, who can heal him. And he gets on his horse and he, he has his entourage and he has all the silver and the gold and, and he goes to the prophet. And uh, he gets there and, you know, his first port of call he goes to the king because he's a great man. And the king says, I don't know what to do with you. So he goes to the prophet and when he gets to the prophet, the prophet doesn't even get out of bed. It sends the servant. So that's already a problem to Naaman. And then, and then he's told to go and wash seven times in the dirtiest river in the, in the land. And he can't do it. And so he rides off and, and, and he's, he's disgusted at, at what has been asked of him. And, and, and some of his, one of his men say to him, My Lord, if, if you had been asked to do something great, would you have done it? <laughs> of course. Hallelujah. But because he was asked to do something lowly and mundane and, and, and you know, he couldn't. Uh, if just imagine if he had stayed on his, his horse, he would have died a leper. But he managed, he, somehow he got off and somehow he got down in the river. And when he did what was expected and what was asked of him, he got healed. And you see, submission is not, a, is not a principle. You understand? It's a principle, but it's not a, it's not a technique. It's not something I can just do. It's like me going, as a young boy, my parents used to go and visit people, you know? And after you visit people, I'd get in the car and my mother would always say, did you say thank you? And I never said thank you. I mean, why do you want to say thank you? That's what parents say, you know? So I had to go back and, and say thank you. And I'd always go in and say, my mom says I must say thank you. <laughs> you know, really sort of sincere, you know? But that's so much the, so often the attitude, you know? We take what we hear. And so we hear of humility and we hear of brokenness and we hear of, of submission and the need to submit to God and the need to submit to his ways and to, to submit to authority in the church and to submit to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But it can't happen unless we're willing to, for pride to be dealt with. And you say, one of the things I've discovered in the ministry of the Holy Spirit is that when he talks about writing on the tablets of our heart, his way of writing and my way of writing is different. His way of writing and Ben's way of writing is different. Thank the Lord for that. I was watching Ben when he was in South Africa with Richard. <laughs> If you, ever, if you ever want to watch something that's really worth laughing at, then you need to find the, the video of that meeting. But anyway. But his writing on our heart is, is, <laughs> is different because it's not a work of, of, of pen or ink. 
It's writing by the Spirit. It's writing by the Spirit. And it's, it's permanent. It's not a temporary thing. It's permanent. When God writes on your heart, it's permanent. When he puts something in your heart, it's permanent. See, revelation is not a good idea. Revelation is not just something, oh, gee, I've never seen that before. And we go out and we forget. Revelation is permanent. It gets in that heart and it stays in that heart and confronts you for the rest of your life. Your new birth experience came by revelation. Did not come by a good idea. You know, so I've heard people, you know, one guy I heard recently said, we need, to, we need to press the refresh button. You know, to, re, you know, to go back to get the original stuff. If that's how we're living, then we have no concept or clue about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So if I want to allow the Holy Spirit to write on the tablets of my heart, I need to understand that he needs to bring a working and a breaking in me. And that's why in Matthew 4 verse 1, it says, Jesus led by the Spirit. How many of you want to be led by the Spirit? If you read the whole verse, then, led by the Spirit into what? The wilderness. I want to be led by the Spirit in my marriage. People have this idea. I want this, this idea that God will give me to tell my wife what to do. I want to be led by the Spirit in disciplining my children. They have this, you know, God will show me exactly what I need to do. But when God leads us by the Spirit, He leads us into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, our lives are broken. And the best thing we can, we can have in, in our relationship with our wife and our relationship with our children is not principles and instructions and in what to do and when to do it. But it's, it's the fragrance that comes with when this, this body and this heart and this life is broken before God. The fragrance of forgiveness, the fragrance of repentance, the fragrance of, of submission in the home. Let's have a look since uh, Richard started in the book of Genesis. It's a good place to start. Chapter 15. What did I say? Sorry, Exodus. Sorry, Exodus. Leaving Genesis, we arrive in Exodus. The people of Israel having come out of the, 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 the slavery, coming through the, the Red Sea, experiencing the deliverance of God, which speaks of our salvation, speaks of our baptism. They turn around and they watch the waters close on the soldiers of the Pharaoh. They rejoice, they sing, they dance. They're so happy that now they're born again, everything's going to be perfect. Uh, like many Christians today, that's the message that people hear. Come to Jesus, everything will be perfect. Come to Jesus, your life will never be the same. That's true. Everything will change. Roses, it'll just be perfect, a blessing and full of joy. Hallelujah. But what happened? Verse 22, Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out where? Into the wilderness. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Hallelujah. It's all coming together. And when they came to Mara, which was a well, they could not drink the waters of Mara for they were bitter. I mean, it's really, really coming together, isn't it? And the people complain because that's what people do, don't they, Richard? And saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, send me to another country. Verse 25, no. <laughs> Read verse 25, brother. <laughs> he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Speaking of the cross. And you see, the reality of the cross is not found when everything is well and everything is going according to plan. The reality of the cross is found when we're in the wilderness. And that's the ministry of the Spirit. And He deals with our lives. And He takes us into a place where we can't depend on ourselves. 
takes us to a place where we can't just depend on our own understanding and, and it's not just words and it's not just principles and it's not just Bible teachings and techniques and whatever. But he takes us to a place where what we have seen and what we have heard becomes reality. In this wilderness where we're broken and we're worked by God and we're shaped by God. I wonder how many times we or how much we pray for our wives, how much we pray for our children. And we pray, Lord, change them. <laughs> Lord, help them to be obedient. Can't understand why he's disobedient. Where does he, where does he get it from? Lord, what's wrong with him? Why is he not hungry for God? Why, don't, why aren't they? Why aren't they? Why doesn't she? Why? 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 And we ask and we ask and we ask. And you see, they are what we are. Amazing. I was talking to pastors the other, last week in, uh, in, I don't know, one of the places I went to. And I was talking about all the problems in the church and the things we find in the church and asked them if that's the same as their church and they all said yes and they were quite shocked when I said, well, the church is a mirror of them. Because like gives birth to like. Flesh to flesh, spirit to spirit. And you see, our families are a representation. They're the mirror of us. Our relationship with our wife is the mirror of our relationship with the Lord. What our children are experiencing is what they have received from us. We are their example, their pattern. They're not going to remember our words. They remember what they've received, what's transmitted. The fragrance that comes from us. And that doesn't come because we're sitting in Bible school. It doesn't come because we're reading notes. It doesn't come because we're listening to message after message after message. But it comes when we're in the wilderness. And God just has this unique way of leading us into the wilderness. And just when we think it's getting tough, he brings us to a well and we think, oh, thank you, Jesus. And we rejoice until we find that the well's full of bitter water. We can't drink it. We can't drink it. And we need the cross to change things, to change the issues and the intent of our heart so that he can write his word on us. Huh? It's a deep work. We read in Galatians chapter 3 where Paul says, How did you receive the things of the Spirit? Did you receive them by the law? Did you receive them by faith? How did you receive these things? Why is it you're so easily bewitched and you've turned back to the teachings and the principles? Where is the ministry of the Spirit? Why? Why have you done this? Why is it all the, the principles? You know, years ago, uh, Mickey, myself, and Stephen, we were in America, and we went to a, we were we were traveling to to spread the good news of, of CTMI. It went very well, and um, uh, we went to a church in, uh, in in a, in, a, in America. Let me just say that <laughs> big church. And we were invited, Mickey was invited to share at a, a, one of the Sunday morning meetings for what they call the blended class. Blended. You know what a blend? A blend is a, when you mix something, you see. A mixer. So I thought, wow, okay. Blended class. So obviously they've got a mixture of, of cultures maybe or, or races. Or, but when I got there, everybody was one color. So that wasn't what they were blended. So I asked the leader of the meeting, you know, I asked the leader of the meeting what, what was the blending part. I said, no, this, these people that are coming to this meeting are all people who have been married and divorced at least once. So I said, okay. So in other words, you have another class for people who have been married and divorced at least once. Twice. He says yes. So we went to that, that meeting as well. And they, they were also blended. And um, 
I met a man there that uh, I really liked. I got on well with him, met him and his wife, and uh, we, in fact, they took, took me for lunch, and uh, very pleasant chaps, and a lady, and, and whatever, and they had a little boy, and I thought, gee, what a lovely couple, but the boy, so I said, is this your grandson? No, 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 because they were quite old, duh. And I as no, no, they said, no, not at all. This is our son. And then they explained that they'd both been married six times before, each. That he'd been married and divorced six times, and, and this was marriage number seven for both of them. And they'd actually met on their first divorce in the church. In fact, that's how they came to know the Lord, I think. And uh, they, that, that's how they found each other. So in the church, same church, thank God for blended classes. But in the church, they, could, they got married and divorced and married and divorced, married and divorced. So over a period of the same amount of years, almost. It was 10 years, six marriages. I, I don't know how many children. He, he, I, don't know, I didn't want to get to, I was by, uh, uh, I couldn't understand it. So about two years later, uh, I went across, we had a CTMI fundraiser, and uh, we, were, we were in this meeting, and um, I recognized the guy again. I said, hey, good to see you, and I looked around for his wife, she wasn't there, and then I saw that he had another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they change wives and husbands more than we change shoes. You see? Because it's just principles. Marriage, you know, God forgives, God does this, God this. It's just, you know, there's nothing there. Because there's no understanding of, of what God wants to bring. And you see, why, why this is so important is that the, 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 the marriage and the family is the, the, a microcosm, it's the picture of the church. If the family is upside down, the church is upside down. So it starts at home. It's easy for me to preach and give you all the good teachings and the principles. But it starts at home. What's happening in our marriage? What's happening in our lives? And you see, the, the, the ministry of the Spirit brings the revelation of the cross to heart, our hearts in such a way that it changes us. It breaks us. It works us. That is not easy. That is not a, an overnight thing. It's a process. It's a lifelong process. And it's so easy to stand in our pride and miss the reality of what God wants to bring in our hearts. Huh? That's why we read in, in the book of Peter uh, that with his pride, God blocks us. God resists the proud. But he gives what? Grace to the humble. He resists the proud. And we can sit in meeting after meeting and we can say, oh Lord, I agree, That's, it's amazing. And, and we just can walk out and say, it was fantastic, it was so blessed. But unless the Holy Spirit has the freedom to bring it to the place where there's a brokenness and that wilderness experience that he can write in your heart the reality, what we hear has no value. And God knows how to bring us to a wilderness. God knows and the address that we need to go to. <laughs> he's, got, he's got our number. And we're all different and he knows exactly how to get us. And to deal with us. And to work in this character. And to work in this, this attitude of heart. Huh? Now we were just talking this morning. But what, what I'm realizing more and more is that. That you know we're born with a personality. And our personality is all different. Thank the Lord. Huh? But our character is formed. And from the time we're, we're, we're born, our character is formed by all the negatives and the positives and the way we raised. So if you had a, a father that was, was a sit-at-home father who didn't care and didn't go to work, and didn't, it, that makes an impact on your life. If you had a father that was abusive 
that makes an impact on your life. It shapes your character. Our, our inferiority comes from, our, from the way we've been raised. Things, the need of, of acceptance, rejection, fears, worries, all of these things are, are built into us from school, from our parents, from, from our country, from the things that we, we live through. It mars, it shapes our character. That inside of that is you. You are unique in your personality. Then you get born again. And now God is, puts you in the program to, to, for your character to be formed into the character of Christ. And so all the bad stuff is exposed, and it's exposed in the wilderness. It's exposed in the fiery trials. It's exposed in hardship. And unless we see and, and understand and have faith in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that when we find ourselves in those places and we cry to God and we say, Lord, whatever it is, break me, deal with me. Bring this humility of heart that you can have access and write something that is permanent there. And you see, God is faithful. What he has begun, he will complete. And the moment you're born again, you come into his path. You come out of your Egypt and you come out of your slavery. And now you come into a place where God wants to work in your life. And it's liberating. And look like you've been baptized in lemon juice tonight. It's liberating. Uh, it's when you try to conform. I remember as a young Christian, my mother came to me and she said, Why can't you be, be like Brother John? And Brother John was, was, used to come to church with a dark suit and had a big Bible and just had this way of walking with his head tilted to one side, you know. <laughs> he had the right pace and the right posture and everybody was, Brother John's coming now, you know. Step aside. And so I tried. I even got a dark suit and I got a dark tie and I got a, I got a bigger Bible. And I tried, but my Brother John look lasted maybe a day, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because I was never called to be Brother John. I'm Brother Peter. And I am me and I'm different. And you are you and you're different. And you have your character and you have all your insecurities and your fears and your worries. And the problem is we bring that into our marriage. We bring that into our family. Uh, you know, years ago, <laughs> there was a saying that children are to be seen and not heard and there are many people I know that was raised on it um, seen and not heard in other words I want to see you but I don't want to hear you if you've got a problem go talk somewhere else if you want to complain and don't make a noise here we're busy many people families that I, I've met over the years where the parents would eat in one room and the children would eat until they came of age you see that you know so there was no family life. And people grow up in that culture and that an attitude and understanding. Women get married expecting to be a doormat because that's a, what they saw in their home. They think marriage is all about abuse and about the man being the guy that always gets his way because that's what they saw and that's what they experienced. Men grow up in a home and that's the way they see their father behave and they think, well, that's how you've got to behave. Come here, woman. That's what is in the character. And that's what God wants to deal with and to break and form us into the image of Christ. And it's a process and it's painful. But joy cometh in the morning. Hallelujah. And when you look around and you see the fruit of that work in your heart and your own life and the life of your family and you can see the reality, you can rejoice in Him. You can rejoice in Him. And I think God wants to expose many things in our life. And you see, what, what we're hearing, you know, it's, it's not easy, this submission thing. You should know better. It's not easy. It's not easy. We, we, you know, just seeing Jesus Christ and an arrow under God, and you think, I can do that. And you put your name under Jesus in an arrow. I can do that. And then you put your wife in an arrow under you. I can do. Oh, oh, oh. 
And then you put your children at an arrow. I can do that. Oh, oh, oh. You can't be serious. It's only God that can work in the heart of man. Like the little boy in the church kept standing on his chair looking around and his father said, sit down. And he wouldn't. He said, sit down. And he wouldn't. And he said, sit down. So finally he pulls him down and he says, I said, sit down. Down. And the boy looks at his father and he says, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> and that's the attitude many people have. Years ago, I remember we had a church. We had a, a stage like this and the, the pastor's room was at the back. And there was a door coming in. And I was praying one day in the, in the, in the it's called the pastor's vestry. I don't know Why? And I was praying there and I looked outside into the car park at the back and I saw this family arrive. Mother, father and four kids and they were fighting and screaming at each other. I mean it was wild. I thought these guys don't need to go to church, they need to go to casualty. Anything's, <laughs> anything, any minute's going to happen. I mean they were wild. I don't know what the kids were up to, I don't know what they'd done en route, but the, he was mad with his wife because she wasn't controlling the kids and the kids were just wild with each other. And the language was... was Unbiblical, <laughs> if I can say that. And I thought, I can't believe this, you know. What do, what do I do? Now I'm going to come out and lead a service. And, you know, when I came out, just in time, I saw them coming in the front door of the church. And they were holding hands. <laughs> and the kids were just angelic. And I thought, what a miracle. <laughs> And indeed it is. It's, it's the miracle of religion. Which many of us know well. Don't we, darling? <laughs> yeah. When we come into the building, we change. Our facade changes. Our demeanor, our attitude, and our action. Everything changes. Don't we, honey? And we come in and we just sit there and we just worship Jesus. And, you know, I mean, it's incredible. I was in a church recently and after the praise and worship, I, there were long announcements I knew and I was going to, so I went down to, you know, to, to, to the bathroom to have a, um, what do you do in bathrooms? And wash my face. And uh, there were some of the musicians standing outside smoking, you see. So I said, why are you guys standing outside smoking? Why don't you just smoke inside? <laughs> What's the problem? And they were horrified because they knew I was being serious. But why should four malls make a difference? Or maybe, maybe because we're outside we think God can't see. It's like Adam hiding behind the bush from God. I mean that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I'm hiding behind a bush from God. It's impossible. But you see that's what religion does. And we, are, we deceive ourselves and we have this mask and we're riding on this, this horse like Naaman and we're, we're full of our pride and I'm an elder, I'm a deacon, I'm a brother, I've been in the church for 150 years and hallelujah, everybody loves me, don't you? And my wife submits to me, don't you? You know? But inside it's dying with leprosy. Dying with leprosy. And leprosy is a picture of sin. And you know, the, when you, <laughs> you know how leprosy works. Okay, you don't. But what happens is it attacks the nerve endings. And the nerve endings die. And, and uh, for a white person, the skin goes red. And then it goes a normalish color. And what happens is that leprosy gets in underneath. And the nerve endings are dead. And you feel like everything's okay. But on the inside, you're dying and then one day you get out of bed and your leg falls off because it's dead it's an exaggeration okay <laughs> it's an exaggeration but but because it, it's dead on the inside because there's no feeling are you are you listening there's no feeling that's what leprosy does that's what sin does that's what pride does it sits there and just 
deals with our feeling and brings us to a place where we have no feeling. When I say feel, I'm not talking emotional stuff. I'm talking about that response to God, what God is saying, what God desires, what he wants to accomplish. And we're dead to that. We're blinded by it. And Naaman could have lost everything. Amazing, we can lose everything. Come to church, say amen, sing, do what we have to do. Go to all the men's meetings, send our wife to all the ladies' meetings, send our kids to all the youth meetings. And everybody is under authority, but not the authority of God, because that's the difference. The authority of man is just outward, outward, outward. But the authority of God is here in our hearts. And we can't hide. And we can't deceive. And that's what God needs to bring in the church. Bring in our lives. Bring in our families. So he has a wilderness for you. Hallelujah. I've been in the wilderness. Anybody else? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I took up residence in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, took up residence forget the tent I just built a house it was, became a place of permanence and it's as if you don't exist and you pray and you pray and you pray and you think why are things not changing why are things not getting any better I don't understand and you pray and you fast I once spent two months fasting to find the will of God and you know what happened to me? I lost weight. I discovered that God was on holiday. He wasn't interested because God resists the proud. He resists the proud. I did everything. I prayed longer, fasted longer, went for counsel, went, spoke, shared, whatever, whatever. But I was living in that wilderness day in day out week in week out month after month and I never understood what God wanted to do in my heart just never understood couldn't believe it was possible that as a preacher I was so used to seeing God do miracles and so used to seeing God work through me and accomplish things through me. I thought, well, I'm okay. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and, she, and this one, come, and he comes. And I think I'm okay until I discovered we're just vessels. God can use us and do with us what he wants. But in the meantime, where do we live? In the wilderness. Until you come to that place where you recognize God needs to bring something in your heart. And you allow that heart to be broken and worked. And the Holy Spirit has access and he writes on it. And he writes on it. And it stays forever. And that's what God wants in our lives. That's what he's looking for in the church. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for men who want that. He's not looking for perfect men. He wouldn't come here. <laughs> Hmm. he wouldn't come here he's not looking for perfection he's just looking for availability huh? looking for men who's just willing to say Lord break me break me bring me to the place where your word can penetrate my heart no matter what bring me to the place where I know what it is to be truly submitted to your will and purpose and you know that's not just a once in a lifetime experience you go from wilderness to wilderness to wilderness as the, the call of God gets deeper and deeper and deeper in our life. Stronger and stronger, richer and richer, less and less of me and more and more of him. Huh? You can feel when somebody wants that. You can feel. It always amazes me. <laughs> When you, after you share a message and somebody comes to me and says, yes, that's what God's been saying to me for the last month, you know? Yeah? It's not what you're hearing here.
You know, you can come into a meeting, not hear a word, and go home a changed man. I've had people come to me and say, Sheesh, what you said on Sunday about, about forgiveness, it just, uh, it just set me free. And I think, I didn't say anything about forgiveness. <laughs> I've even gone back and, and re replayed the message. And I thought, what church did he go to? But when the heart is open, God will say to you and minister to you as he wants to. Hallelujah. It's amazing. It's amazing. And then he's looking for this humility and openness to God. And you can feel somebody that's like that. You can feel. And when you're talking with a brother and, and, and you share with them and then he says, don't you think? Or but. What about? Now you know. This little brain is going and working and deciding and discussing. How am I going to get this through to my wife? Or how am I going to do how, what? What does this mean? It's got nothing to do with this. It's got everything to do with this. It needs to ride in our hearts. Let's stand to our feet tonight.